15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, the astronomy podcast uh, that we bring you every week from all corners of the world. We have an international audience. There's uh, people from Australia and Tasmania who listen, and <laughs> there is also Professor Fred Watson. That was an inside joke. Fred will understand it. Yes, indeed. And it's Tasmanias, very nice to... Tasmanians will be sending me brickbats. <laughs> well, you deserve them. I know. Yeah, it's a great place, is Tasmania. It is. It's I love lovely. Tasmania. Actually, you know what? I can I can redeem myself by saying that's where Judy and I spent our honeymoon. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love Tasmania. It was January and it was freezing. <laughs> That's, that's, that's why you go. Yes, true, true. Uh, yeah. That might not sound unusual to anyone on the northern side of the equator, but January here is one of the hottest months of the year, so um, it's, a, it's a bit bizarre. Everything's sort of flipped on its head. Uh, anyway, Fred, uh, hello. Nice to talk to you again. <laughs> you mean it's another week? We've got to talk again? I know. Good we try to these... avoid each other at all costs, and it just, <laughs> just never works. It's like marriage. Now, uh, let's... <laughs> don't even go there. Don't uh, even... It's too late. It's way too late. We're going to talk about moonquakes because they have been confirmed. And the beautiful part of this story is that they've used technology from 50 years ago to figure all this out. I think that's awesome. Uh, we're also going to look at um, something NASA's done. They've done an asteroid striking Earth simulation, and it ain't pretty. And uh, a story I, I came across today, Fred, that I thought was worth mentioning because Australia is involved, and that's the Square Killer Meter Array, which you and I have discussed. But they've got a um, new supercomputer, uh, in fact, two of them, that they're going to uh, create for part of the project, uh, which will be the, um, uh, the biggest supercomputer ever made. So uh, we'll look into that and some questions. One about the orbit of the International Space Station. Why is it so is basically the question. And um, another question about life in our galaxy. Uh, yes, no, maybe. We'll get to those. But let's talk about uh, moonquakes, Fred, because um, they have basically used technology from, uh, I think it was about four Apollo missions, to analyse what's happening on the moon, and basically she's doing a bit of a shimmy shimmy. Indeed, that's right. Um, it, so we've kind of known about the moonquakes since, um, really since the Apollo era, because uh, I think it was for nine years those uh, seismometers that were left on the moon by the Apollo astronauts, and you're quite right, it was four of those missions. Um, there were six missions that, that um, actually had astronauts walking on the moon. Four of them deployed seism seismometers. Uh, so during that period uh, of uh, eight or nine years, uh, which you know was the time that these instruments remained active, which is pretty good going because they were they were all solar powered. They probably had batteries that were nineteen. 69 quality batteries they wouldn't be all that brilliant um, and they lasted for that time and sent back copious quantities of of data thousands of moonquakes um, and the the by the technology of the day you could kind of triangulate between the different seismometers you've got four of them on the near side of the moon they're not very far apart because they're all kind of in the equatorial latitudes of the moon and they're all on the near side um, and it, it's by having seismometers a long way from each other that you can really see what's going on inside a planet we use it on the earth all the time and yep. of course you as you and i have mentioned there's now a seismometer on the planet Mars, courtesy of the InSight uh, lander that's there, which has detected a Mars quake. It has. Um, on the moon, um, as I said, thousands of uh, moonquakes were detected. But because of this uh, fairly close separation of the seismometers, um, it wasn't really possible to locate them, um, particularly the shallow ones. The deep ones uh, you could get a handle on, and um, we, we believe that the, the moon's interior is still cooling down, and that's what causes the deep moonquakes. Um, but um, it's taken until now 
to really find out what's been going on with the with the shallow ones. And it comes about because of another NASA project kind of 50 years later, not quite actually, I think it's been in orbit around the moon for probably the best part of a decade already. Uh, Lunar, Recon- Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is a NASA spacecraft. It orbits the moon. It's done the most magnificent high resolution imagery of the moon's surface. You and I have talked before about the fact that Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has sent us back pictures of all the lo- uh, the Apollo landing sites. Yes. And you can see the the footprints and the buggy tracks and the uh, the base of the of the lunar modules all sitting there. The McDonald's chip packets. The chip packets and everything. That's right. <laughs> but more especially, I'll ignore that one. What um, what Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has done is allowed um, fine resolution imagery of the surface of the natural features on the surface, and what. They've done, the the scientists who who are running the show, is that they've found all these uh, youthful looking fault scarps. And you know what a fault is. It's when the the, the land slips vertically uh, with respect to the other half. There's a line uh, that divides two bits of land and one is slipped vertically with respect to the other. And you get a fault. We've we've got many of them in Australia. Yeah, yeah, we have. They're all over the world. Yeah, indeed, that's right. So these are, but they look youthful from the imagery, and by that I mean that their edges are sharp. Uh, you know, you've got a, you've got something that's obviously moved within the recent past, and erosion, because erosion does take place on the moon, even though it's very slow, hasn't had time to round all the edges off. Mm. Uh, old features tend to be more rounded. These look quite young. But what is the clincher on that is that um, it was Apollo 17, the final Apollo mission, uh, manned, oh, crewed by Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt. They saw one of these faults, Uh, when they were on their Apollo 17 mission. And they actually drove to it uh, on the moon with their moon buggy and grabbed some rock samples. And that those rock samples um, showed that it was a very young structure, that the the, the, the scarps probably were younger than 10 million years. And that's young in geological times. Certainly young in astronomical times. Yeah, it's uh, young by comparison with us as well, but yeah, it's very... <laughs> quite, quite useful. So, so the, the, there's this clinching set of evidence. The Apollo guys found the rock by one of these young-looking faults and demonstrated that, yes, it is young-looking. Um, but now knowing where these faults are because of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Survey, uh, the, the mission scientists for that have identified, I think, 3,000 of them. It's a, it's a huge number. And so... What they've now done is built that knowledge into the records of the seismometers that Apollo left on the moon. And sure enough, it turns out that you can actually locate uh, many of the tremors to these fault areas. Uh, Uh It's a lovely piece of of science with data separated by 50 years almost. But it actually demonstrates that um, there is tectonic activity happening on the moon because these Mars quakes, sorry, moon quakes, far from being mostly caused by meteorites, which is what everybody expected because mm. people expected the moon to be tectonically dead, just nothing happening there, um, nothing to see, please move along. It's not like that at all. Um, it looks as though the, uh, the the moon surface is still active. And what is thought to be causing that activity is the shrinkage of the moon as its interior cools. So as the moon cools, it it gets smaller because it's contracting, and that contraction actually um, causes the fault lines on the surface and gives you these these moon quakes. There is one other piece of clinching evidence with this, Andrew, which I've failed to mention so far, and that is that these things were more common um, when the moon was at its nearest and farthest points from the Earth. And those are the points where you've got the biggest tidal stress on the moon. Ah, oh, so it's a combination factor. So it's the shrinking of the moon and its position in proximity to us in terms to, to of its gravitational right. effect. So what you've probably got is the moon shrinking all the time, but it takes a little bit of an extra bit of stress to push the thing, the fault, into a little bit of slippage. Ah. Uh, then gives rise to the to the to the moon quake. Wow. Um, very, very nice science uh, indeed. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it, re- it reveals a mystery, actually, because um, the current thinking 
uh, has been that the moon is cold and dead. Its interior really doesn't have anything going on inside, uh, not, nothing molten like we've got in the center of the Earth. Remember, the moon's only a quarter of the diameter of the Earth, so it's, it's, it would have cooled much more quickly. Mm. Um, and yet, uh, it's still got enough heat that it's losing that heat and causing the contraction. So the mystery is, where is the moon's interior heat coming from? It sounds as though there's more heat coming from the moon, uh, the moon's interior than we expected. And maybe that might give rise to another moon mission, a bit like InSight, which has a temperature probe on it, which is currently stuck, I think, uh, as it tries to burrow down into the ground. But the temperature probe is designed to show how much heat's coming from the interior of Mars. You could do the same sort of thing on the moon. Okay. I, hope, yeah. I hope NASA is listening to Space Nuts because oh. we... They're full of ideas. For well, I, I, I often send it to them. <laughs> I do. I, I, I bet you never get a reply. <laughs> not really, but I, I, also, I, I never expect one. Is, is it possible that the um, activity of um, you know, Earth being a, a, a bigger um, body is, is perhaps causing a friction effect inside the moon and, and heating it up? Like uh, you look at uh, how the gas giants impact on their moons and some of them are quite volatile because of well, yes, that's right. the, so, the exactly. gravitational effect. Yeah, so, that's, so you're thinking of Jupiter and its yeah. moon Io or Io, which is the most volcanically active body in the solar system because of the gravity of Jupiter being right next door. Um, yes, there's, there's an that I'm sure there's a, a, an, an element of that because we know that the tidal effect of the Earth is actually imparting energy to the moon. The, the, the Earth itself is giving up rotational energy, which is why we need leap seconds every now and again. Uh, and that energy is going into speeding up the moon. So there are definitely forces at play there which um, could indeed be contributing to that. I think it's the, that is locked up in what we were talking about, the, the fact that the moon is nearer and further away from the Earth at different times in its orbit. Mm. Uh, plate tectonics on the Earth is unlikely to have any direct influence on the moon. It's got much more of an influence on what goes on here. And that's why we can't see ancient, ancient craters on the surface of the Earth, because at least not terribly ancient ones, because they've all been rubbed out by plate tectonics. Yes, indeed. That's fascinating, though. And it's, it's, I just love the fact that um, 50 years on, we've now developed the technology to analyse the data from Apollo and go, oh, now we know what happened. <laughs> exactly. Quite so. <laughs> it's awesome. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here and Professor for Ed Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, a uh, fascinating story uh, from, strangely enough, NASA. Uh, and uh, it, it's about um, a simulation they've done to see what would happen to Earth if, if it was hit by a huge rock. Now, we, we've talked about this before and, you know, talked about different sized asteroids and what sort of impact they might have. Uh, uh, Chelyabinsk is, is the most recent significant event that we've seen where people were, were injured, thankfully not killed, by the explosive effect. But then we got into talking about bigger rocks and what might happen, this, that or the other. Uh, well, now NASA's actually done it to see what would happen. How big a rock were they playing with? Well, at the end of the day, it was, um, it was 60 metres, which is <clears throat> three times the size of the Chelyabinsk uh, object, and so you've got rather more than three times the destructive impact. So the story here, Andrew, is um, I think this is a very nice piece of work. There is a conference uh, which I think is now over. Uh, it was uh, somewhere near Washington D.C. in the United States, and it is the planetary. Oh, that's Defense... called Congress, I think. <laughs> <laughs> might be, might be called Congress. It's yeah. all over. Uh, the 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 non-Congress conference <laughs> was was the Planetary Defense Conference. And so it was all about experts on, uh, you know, how you might deflect asteroids and what asteroids can do when they impact. And, of course, uh, many from NASA and many from the European Space Agency. Uh, and what they did was they, they kind of played war games, in a sense, with asteroids. Mm -hmm. um, they had five days of the conference and essentially the organizers simulated um, a developing situation over two fictional years. Um, and 
what they did was they they basically tweeted people with what the latest was. So you were sitting in this conference, presumably listening to many learned talks, while getting tweets saying uh, we're all doomed or <laughs> things to that effect. Um, of course, everybody knew that it was a simulation, and uh, every article I've read about this is at pains to point out that this is a simulation because at the moment there is uh, nothing uh, we know about capable of hitting the earth for at least a hundred years. We, we kind of established that reasonably well, but okay. What happens if we do find a near earth object um, and it looks as though it's threatening the earth. So what they did was um, they simulated the discovery of a, an, a, a, an asteroid, which they named 2009 PDC. Now PDC, of course, means planetary defense conference because <laughs> it's not the normal not the normal um, way that you, um, you you name asteroids it would have letters and numbers if it was a conventional name but it's fictional so it's 2019 pdc and uh, the initial uh, the initial observations suggested that this thing would actually be a likely impactor in the year 2027 uh actually hitting somewhere near Denver, Colorado. Uh, and they estimate that this thing is 260 meters across. Now that's big enough to do definitely statewide damage. You're talking about a huge disaster area. And so, but they've realized that they've got eight years to do something about it. So they basically, they organized to send impactors to deflect the movement of the asteroid uh, which is what you do, what we would do if we found an asteroid that had, we had that long lead time, eight years is reasonably long time to do something about it. Mm. Um, I think the, the simulation said they built and launched half a dozen spacecraft with what are called kinetic impactors. They, these are things you really blast into the asteroid just to push it off course rather than blow it up or anything. So they did that. Um, apparently in the simulation, uh, three of them, Three of those missions were successful, not all six, but um, they had a kind of unexpected disaster in that while the main part of the asteroid was deflected uh, so that it wouldn't pose a threat, uh, a 60 meter chunk broke off. And basically, uh, that was the one that they had to deal with because it was heading straight for the Earth in uh, three years down the track. So uh -huh. 2022. Um, and then, you know, there were all kinds of, you know, you had to debate what you're going to do. Um, there was talk of a, a nuclear weapon to take it out. Uh, that, of course, always gives you the risk that you just wind up with a whole lot of smaller stuff coming down uh, in the same direction. Uh, but they, in the scenario, they um, I thought this was quite a nice touch. Apparently, Washington, uh, the U.S. government was crippled by political disagreements. And so nothing happened. <laughs> oh, um, that sounds very human. <laughs> it does. Yeah. But uh, in the end, it comes down to civil defense. They've got this thing coming in at nearly 20 kilometers per second uh, with a, probably an airburst uh, and uh, over a, a, an area something like 10 kilometers across. Uh, you've got total devastation. Um, you know, people people would not survive it. Mm. So you've got the issue of trying this. Oh, I forgot to mention it's aiming straight for New York, you know, just as a. Why a do minor. they always pick on New York? Well, you know, it's kind of. Why don't they have a crack at Trundle or something? Well, Trundle's okay because there's only 90 people living in Trundle. I know. Trundle, all out on a bus. You and know, they haven't got the internet yet, so it's safe that I can say it. I know they have. They have got it. I, I, lo I like Trundle. I, I do I think, too. I think you'd not Trundle. It's a great place. Isn't Trundle where they've got the biggest, the widest main street in, in, in New Australia? Yeah, 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 because they used to do U-turns with bullocks. Bullock yeah, exactly. That's why it's good. That's true. <laughs> Um, and I used to go there as a kid. My my uncle was the bank manager there, so we went there for holidays. Um, well, I love Trundle. I think it's a great little town. I, I did just, a gig I there. I just like taking that. the mickey out of places. You I do mean, take the mickey out people of People take the mickey out of Dubbo all the time. So, mm. you know, it's payback. <laughs> so why wasn't Dubbo a target for this simulation? Yeah, I don't know. It probably yeah, well, there you go. it's been a anyway. target for everything else for so long. Yes, that's right. So, so the simulation says you, you're going to trash New York and you've yeah. got the problem of getting people out of the way. And I think that's where it kind of came to an end. Um, but what it highlighted was some real, real sci science technology, not science fiction, but real science, because uh, there are two missions. Um, and I think this is a collaboration between NASA and ESA uh, to 
send two spacecraft towards an asteroid, uh, which is an interesting one because like several asteroids, it's a binary system. So you've got a big object and a small one mm. uh, in orbit around one another. And what I think they're going to do is try and try and knock the small one out of its orbit or at least see whether you can oh. deflect it wow. to give it a try. So uh, they'll launch uh, in two years' time. Uh, sorry, ESA's will launch, I think, next year. It might even be this year. NASA's will launch in two years' time. Uh, and the project is called DART, which stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Uh, and it's designed to see whether we can shift an asteroid. Um, it's a, not an asteroid that has any threat to the Earth. It's perfectly innocent. Uh, by the time they finish with it, it might be. Uh, you hope that everybody will get their sums right. Uh, but it's an ideal one, they say, for testing the technology. So moving the small component of, of this asteroid out of the way. The, the Venusians are toast, but they were already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 400, 470 degrees Celsius, you're pretty well burnt toast as well, I think. Yes. Wow, that's fantastic. Of course, um, uh, we know a lot about what's out there at the moment. And you know, by comparison, like this is a 60-metre chunk we're talking about. Um, the the um, asteroid that finished off the dinosaurs was like 15 kilometres in diameter. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and I, I read that the largest one that we know of in our solar system is nearly a thousand kilometers in diameter. We don't want well, to get hit by that. No, that's right. But that's that's Ceres, which is actually big enough to be a dwarf planet. Ah, and okay. Ceres is is well and truly in the main asteroid belt. It's never so it's not moving anywhere near the Earth. Not, not as far as we're... anyway. Well, that's, that's good right. to yeah. know. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now it was a good simulation, and I'll be really interested to see how they go with that test to move an asteroid and see if they can actually do it. Because one day we'll probably have to. One day we might need it. That's right. Exactly. So more power to their elbow. Yeah. All right. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, we would normally go into some questions. And we will. But there's something we, a couple of things we need to talk about. One of them is the Square Kilometre Array. That's uh, that collaboration that involves uh, Australia, Africa and New Zealandish land. And the latest news on that is the supercomputer that they're planning to create to kind of crunch all this data they're going to collect. And from all reports, this is going to be one mega, mega device. I mean, it'll, you know... But it'll far outweigh anything that's ever been created before. That's absolutely right. Let me um, just start though with with a correction there. And the no, correction's not... no, I never make mistakes. No, you didn't. It was me who made it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> because I told you some time ago that uh, New Zealand would be part of the Square Kilometer Array, and indeed that was the original plan. But um, during um, the, the time when the the final uh, you know the final layout of the square kilometer array was being decided uh, it turns out that uh, the antennas for the australian end of it will all fit into western australia ah. so you don't need to extend it beyond the boundaries actually not even beyond the boundaries of the state let alone the boundaries uh, of the nation so uh, yes so um it, it's um it, it's you know, the Kiwis are certainly part of it in the sense that they are collaborators in the program. There are 40 countries involved with the Square Kilometre Array, so they are very much a part of the of the show, but it won't extend onto uh, New Zealand soil. Fair enough. Okay, I understand. And they didn't have enough wool to build the antennas anyway, so... <laughs> yes, quite so. <laughs> Sheep uh, joke, sorry, can't help it. It's all right. No, look, look, we'll let you off, don't we? <laughs> uh, the... The really interesting thing, I think, right from the beginning of the Square Kilometre Array project has been that the amount of data that it will produce uh, has always been thought to be greater than the capabilities of data analysis um, hardware and software at the present time, mm. uh, whatever the present time happens to be. And that's still the case. Uh, the amount of data that it will produce is colossal. I'm actually just looking for the figure as we speak, but I, I can't remember. It's a colossal number of petabytes. Oh, you know. it's just 
astronomical. Bon, uh, to, to, bon yeah. or they're talking petaflops and petabytes and yeah, that's right. It's it's huge quantities. So um, you know, I've I've seen it put in terms of. Uh, how big the pile of mobile phones would be that was taking the data for one second <laughs> yeah. uh, from the you know, from the square kilometer rate. So the, it has always been regarded as a you know one of the future challenges <clears throat> of the square kilometer array was to to produce the data you know the data analysis hardware and software. And the reason why we're talking about this is that that is in the news, and it's because the design has now been completed for something called the SDP, which is the Science Data Processor for uh, for the Square Kilometer Array. And um, the bottom line is that it will be the fastest in the world. It will be every other fast computer, hands down. Well, the fastest we are- one at the moment is IBM's Summit. And yes, that's this right. This one, they reckon, will be 25% faster. Indeed, that's correct. A computing power of around 250 something flops <laughs> petaflops. flops that's right that's the so, word so it's um 600 600 petabytes of data every year Gosh. uh and you divide that by 365 to work out what it is in a day it's a lot um and a petabyte of course is a thousand terabytes and a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes so you're talking a million gigabytes there so yeah colossal amounts um the 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 data speed, uh, I think this is fantastic, is 100,000 times faster than the average global broadband speed in 2022. Which makes so, it a million times faster than uh, yes, Australia's what you, NBN. <laughs> quite. It's just, it's just they're, they're mind-boggling numbers, and they've always been mind-boggling numbers. And I guess it's only now, um, you know, in something like the 10th year of the SKA project uh, that we're starting to really come to terms with it, with the design of the STP, the Science Data Processing yeah. Center. And it, it, it's great to see this. I think um, this has been regarded as something of a triumph because uh, you, you, you know, you can have blue sky ideas and say, oh, yes, the technology will catch up. Uh, that's all very fine. But to actually design the technology before it's caught up, I think that's pretty pretty impressive. It is indeed. And what amazes me even more in the story is that they're, they'll be able to get all the parts from Radio Shack. I think that's <laughs> fantastic. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I, I, look, uh, I'd love to have a computer like that at my place. But um, I'd be dreaming. I don't think I could well, afford yeah. the, the, you know, the 10th mortgage. <laughs> all, you'd, all you'd use it for would be recording space nuts. So it'd be a waste, yes. of, a yeah. waste of a good computer. Editing music, yeah. I think most people underutilise their computing power at home. I, right. I, I really believe that. Uh, yes, you're listening to Space Nuts. Uh, of course, um, I, I mentioned the last couple of weeks that we now have a YouTube channel. So if you search for Space Nuts Podcast on YouTube, you will find us. All our episodes are now uploaded to YouTube. And I think, uh, Fred, we now have over 70 followers on YouTube. Our magic target is 1,000. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to get uh, that many people at least following us on YouTube. And uh, it's such a popular platform. I'm very hopeful that we'll do that. The other thing that we're, um, that we're doing is um, we, we have a Patreon account for people and this came from the audience. People uh, wanted to contribute to the program uh, in terms of actual dollars. And so we now have uh, a bunch of people that are doing that. And we just want to send a big shout out and thank you to uh, Mark Snelson, Hannah Webb. Now, I remember the name Hannah Webb, and I suspect she's the um, the airline pilot that sent us those noctilucent cloud photos. So uh, Hannah's involved in this. Uh, Dan Thompson, David Watson, Tim Gibbs, uh, who's one of the uh, one of a couple of people who actually initiated the idea of us creating Patreon, uh, Sydney Dark, uh, and Nicholas Lindsay. So thank you all for um for for supporting us. We we uh, we're we're chuffed. It's it's fantastic, for it isn't it? It, it, it is. It's, uh, it amazes me actually. It astonishes me that um that we've got um this level of support from given you know the. Uh, the, lo- the really rather poor quality of our product. Uh, I think it's quite astonishing. Speak no, for I myself. I shouldn't do it down. <laughs> I, think, I think you and I, between us, we, we do um, a half-decent job. Well, we try. 
<laughs> We're very trying. Yeah. Yes. Um, but thank you all. Now, I did mention Mark Snelson. Uh, Mark has actually uh, sent us a question um, a few light years ago, uh, which we are going to get to right now. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your question, and um, thank you for, for um, pitching the Patreon idea. A couple of people have come to us with it. Uh, he said, I, I, I recently started being fascinated uh, by and following the position of the International Space Station on ESA's website. Uh, can Fred explain why this particular orbit, 51.64 degrees, according to Wikipedia, was chosen for the ISS? Uh, the ESA site says that the ISS sees 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24 hours. That would really kill your sleep cycle. Uh, would a satellite in 90-degree orbit see more or fewer? What about one in zero-degrees orbit? Um, thanks and keep up the good work. And, and he goes on to say, by the way, how can we listeners donate? Well, it's done. Thank you, Mark. That's awesome. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, congratulations, Mark. <laughs> you did a good one there. <clears throat> now, good question. So, yeah, really interesting question. Um, and it's got a fairly complicated answer, but uh, let me just try and summarise what the issues are when you put something like the International Space Station into orbit. If you want to save energy and have the kind of minimum energy that's needed to get all these huge bits of hardware up into orbit, uh, what you want to do is put it in an equatorial orbit, one that goes around the equator, because that's the way that you get the biggest, if you're launching from the equator, that's how you get the biggest bang for your buck. You get uh, about one and a half kilometers per second free. Uh, uh, it's just a bit less than that. It's about one kilometer per second free of the eight kilometers per second that you need uh, because the Earth's rotation actually propels you into space in the right direction, uh, assuming you launch to the east. So that's the reason for going for low inclination orbits. Of course, if you want to surveil the whole surface of the Earth, uh, then you need a high inclination orbit. You want to be at 90 degrees so that you can see the entire planet passing between you, uh, beneath you uh, at certain times in the orbit. And that's why most military spacecraft are in what are called polar orbits. They go over the North and South Poles. So um, it's usually a kind of um, a compromise between those two extremities. Uh, and apparently the bottom line with the ISS orbit is all to do with the practicalities of launching astronauts there from the, the Russian launch facility in Baikonur. <clears throat> it turns out that that 51.6 degrees is actually the lowest inclination that you could directly launch in from Baikonur. So if you're going to be using Soyuz spacecraft, and of course that's the that's been the workhorse of getting astronauts up and down to the ISS for uh, ever since 2011, um, then you've got to have a spacecraft in that orbit. And the the mission planners for the ISS, who uh, of course it was a, a fully international venture. Uh, so the Russians would definitely have put in their bid for that inclination so that they could access it directly. And it's a totally valid reason for doing it, you know, it's, uh, which has turned out to be extremely valid because uh, for the last um, seven, eight years, there haven't been any human launches from, from uh, Cape Canaveral. Wow. So that's the bottom line. Okay. Uh, just going on to the next bit of the question, though, um, it doesn't actually make any difference what inclination orbit you're in. This is the, the angle of inclination to the equator as to the hours of daylight and darkness you see. Uh, it's still every 90-ish minutes that you go around in orbit because what controls that is not the angle of the inclination. It is the, uh, the height above the Earth's surface. The higher you get, the longer you take to go around. But at the height of the ISS... Uh, it's, as you said earlier, it's 16 times in a day. And if you think about it, the, uh, always, you've always got half the Earth in daylight, half the Earth in shadow. So it's really not going to make any difference what angle your spacecraft is at to the equator as to how much darkness you see. You'll always have uh, a daylight and darkness every 90 minutes. Yeah, and of course you can't slow down because <laughs> then you don't stay up there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so Indeed, you come back down to us very quickly if you yes. slow down. Or you bounce off and end up in 
oblivion. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for more than one reason, but appreciate the question and I uh, hope we managed to sort it out for you. Uh, now we move on to a question from, well, all I've got is Simmons, so I'm pretty sure Simmons will know who Simmons is. And Simmons, thank you for your question. Uh, now, he says, or she says, I'm assuming it's a surname, uh, do you think Fermi's paradox means there is probably no technologically advanced life in our galaxy? I'm coming to believe this is true, even to the point that it's unlikely there are other intelligent life uh, or there is other intelligent life currently in existence in our galaxy. Oh, Hugh, there, sorry, it's separated on the lines. Hugh Simmons. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, <laughs> we have talked about this before, and um, I think we concluded last time we discuss discussed it that, that it's starting to look like we are an anomaly. Um, so uh, I can answer part of Hugh's question by saying, well, there is actually <laughs> intelligent, technologically advanced life in our in our galaxy because we're it. But beyond this place, um, yes, the the it's a big question mark over that. So yes, you pretty well answered the question there. And Andrew. thanks for coming. We'll see you next week. <laughs> um, there's just a little bit more to it, perhaps, that we can add. Uh, yeah, Fermi's paradox, which was um, posed back in the 1960s by Enrico Fermi, a well-known uh, physicist, Italian physicist. Uh, the question is, where are they all? Because if you if you say, okay, um, intelligent life is possibly commonplace throughout the galaxy, um, in particular, it may well be that in some parts of the galaxy, intelligent life evolved much, much earlier than we have. And so if that's the case... Why don't we see evidence of that intelligent life, either in radio signals leaking from uh, extraterrestrial communications or from spacecraft that, that visit you? Because uh, even if it takes you know a million years to get from one star to the next, uh, as it might if you're using normal chemical propulsion, um, if you've got a civilization that's long enough, that has lasted long enough, that shouldn't be a problem. You You have... Um, long space journeys with colonies of people on board and they just carry on their normal daily lives but they're not on a planet they're on a spacecraft and then they get somewhere else and then they you know build another one and so it, it, you essentially have this um, you know this multiplication of life throughout the galaxy we don't see that we see no evidence whatsoever mm. of intelligent life and so Fermi's paradox um, is still asked but I think uh, Hughes point is well made because the astrobiology community i think is leaning towards exactly the viewpoint that he's expressed that um it is seems increasingly likely that we are as you, exactly as you said we're an anomaly we're a we're a weird freak uh, of circumstance within uh, what would otherwise be a perfectly normal star system with planets and things like that but nothing worthwhile in the in, in in the idea of intelligent life on it and, and we we've, we're glossing over how you define intelligent life um i i think uh, it was carl sagan who's who defined it as being uh organisms that are functionally the equivalent of ourselves um you know that means they can do what we can do well, which that, are, that's the standard we've set isn't it it's the standard we've set. It's the only one we know it's about. It's pretty really. low, but it's the standard. <laughs> it's the standard we've Speak set. for yourself. <laughs> well, I'm lower than you, I think. No, I don't know. I think I've got the functional equivalent of your average ant sometimes. Anyway, that's a not not aunt, ant, uh, A-N-T. Um, the, the other thing that feeds into this is the view that I think is also growing, that while microbial life might be common throughout the universe, um, the step to get from a microbe to a multi-celled organism and then thence to, you know, vertebrates and primates and humans and all the rest of it, that first step is one that demands huge quantities of energy and could be extremely rare. And the reason why scientists point to that is that as far as we know, it only happened once on Earth, or at least it only succeeded once, because uh, what's called eukaryotic life on Earth, multi-celled life, can be traced back to a a single um, ancestor. It's called Luca, the last universal common ancestor. So if, if we'd found traces of a different common ancestor on the Earth in you know the genome of some species, then you might have said, well, okay, it has happened more than once, so it might happen more than once in the universe. But the fact that it's only happened once in the 4.6 billion year history of the Earth uh, 
leads to the suspicion that even, you know, even plant life might be very rare throughout the universe, let alone intelligent life. So um, Hugh's point is well made. It's an interesting one that would answer the Fermi paradox very neatly. Why don't what, what, you know, why don't we see them? Where are they all? Well, they're just not there. At least they're not there yet. Well, that's the other side of it. Uh, yeah. We might be first. But we might be it, first. That's it right. might happen again. But <clears throat> by the time it sort of reaches the level we're at, we might be well gone too. So it's just, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and w- would they be able to find evidence of our activity? Depends where they are in the universe. It does indeed. There are, you know, there, is, there are permanent... Um, reminders of humankind in this in the shape of uh, not just the radio emissions from from the earth but the five spacecraft that are leaving the solar system all of which carry uh, anything from little plaques to uh, to human ashes uh, new horizons has <clears throat> an ounce of um, of uh, Clyde Tombo's ashes on board it uh, the discoverer of pluto uh, and and the other the other Thing is the the LP records on the Voyager spacecraft yeah. launched in the 1970s using 1970s technology and everyone whinged about it because the technology's changed and we've gone digital but vinyl made a comeback yeah it did indeed yeah and there, there are instructions on it how to how to play these things yeah. we're we're assuming they can read <laughs> so we make a lot of assumptions don't we but um... well pictorial pictorial uh depictions uh, so if they don't have eyes yes there's a problem there yeah well we didn't just... think of that did we mm-hmm. mm. anyway it's um it's something we'll continue to ponder i mean really we we don't know absolutely and you can never say never as you I can never say never say that's it. right because there are 10 to the power 23 stars in the observable universe, and each one has probably got a planet or two. So yeah. you know, that's a lot of stars to go and check out. And it brings you back to that old analogy, if we're the only ones, it's a hell of a waste of space. Uh, it raises all kinds of existential questions, like why are we here and it what's it all for? And yes. why do people listen to Space Nuts? <laughs> That's the biggest <laughs> question of all. Oh, yeah. And we hope they will continue to listen, and uh, we, we thank them very kindly for their, uh, for their support, their questions, their comments, their observations. We love it all. Uh, and thank you, uh, Hugh, for your question. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Fred, as always, for um, you know providing us with uh, so much uh, great information. It's terrific. It's a great pleasure, Andrew, and good night to everybody or good morning or whatever time you're listening, and we'll speak again next week. Professor Fred Watson, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.